In the land of the midnight sun, modern Scandinavians carry on a Viking tradition as they prepare to celebrate an ancient festival. This is the day of longest sunlight, the beginning of summer. And on the island of Godoy, off Norway's west coast, the young gather fuel to build bonfires. The summer lord and lady usher in midsummer night. This is a joyous occasion, a chance for the island's inhabitants to come together to celebrate the out of doors. Their pagan ancestors paid homage to the sun and believed that bonfires would help renew its energy. For this is the time the sun reaches its highest point in the sky. Primitive people believe that without their help, the sun would fail to warm the earth. And everywhere in Europe, ancient people saw the sun's change of course as a moment of great significance. The Vikings saw every event a bit above the ordinary as the occasion for a celebration. In this, their descendants haven't changed. For some, the open sea beyond the fjords and harbors of Godoy is a living memory of a life that's past. For others, it holds the promise of the future. Captain Ingvald Dub, for 45 years, sailed the great fishing banks from Norway to the Greenland Sea. Someday, his grandson hopes to do the same. Arnbid Dub, the old man's eldest son, is now captain of the family vessel. Returning from three weeks of fishing off the Shetland Islands, he is welcomed home by his son and father. Its mission not yet over, the ship passes within sight of homes and families, steaming to the Norwegian mainland with its catch. The Dib family's vessel, Leicestershire, is one small part of Norway's fishing fleet, just one of hundreds of family-owned boats that fish the waters from Spitsbergen to Greenland, from Newfoundland to Africa. For this colorful armada, the final destination is Olesund, one of the largest fishing ports in Norway. The Leicestershire ties up along with other ships at the cooperative, which will sell their catch. It has some 60 tons aboard to be sorted as it's unloaded. Large blue ling for Swedish Christmas meals. The smaller ling, white and blue, will be salted and sent to Spain, Brazil, and Portugal. Since the days of sails and wooden hulls, the dibs have plied the northern seas, from the fishing banks to Olesund and home to the island of Godoy. For generations, their boats have been their pride, the means of their existence. And Homeport is a village which bears the family name, the tiny town of Dib. Those who sail and those who wait ashore, moments together are precious. In Dub, a family reunion becomes a holiday. The sea provides the feast and the cause for celebration. In this village, the ebb and flow of life is determined by the sea. With the ship in port, 
three generations are drawn together at the retired captain's home. On the Norwegian island of Godoy, a single family has its own Thanksgiving for a good catch and a safe return. The feast shatters an old Viking tradition. At this table, there is no alcohol, ever. Ingvald Dub would not tolerate it, and none would dare oppose him. Younger men now rule the family's fortunes on the open sea. But at this table, the older generations are still held in great esteem. For it is they who have passed on to their sons the life inherited from their fathers. These family gatherings are rare, for the men spend most of their lives at sea. For perhaps 500 years, on some small boat in the North Atlantic, men named Dub have lived and worked together, day after day, year after year, isolated on their own tiny, bobbing world. Now there are 10 of these men named Dib, still facing the sea, their ancient enemy, and their only provider. Three hundred and fifty miles from Norway's coast and midway to Iceland, the men of the Dib family prepare the lines and bait the hooks. The Leicestershire begins to prowl the North Atlantic in search of cod. A thousand years ago, their Viking ancestors crossed this angry sea to Iceland, navigating by the sun and the stars. Now they use electronics, not only to maintain their course, but to pursue their prey. The echo sounder helps detect the schools of fish. And the technology of man is verified by nature's timeless signal, hungry gulls from the nearby Faroe Islands. To mark the beginning of the run, a buoy is dropped, weighted with a small anchor. The Leicestershire does not use a trawl, but feeds out hundreds of yards of baited line marked by floating buoys. Below decks, the line with hooks every few feet is carefully played out, while the boat maintains its course and speed. Marked by buoys and dragged down by anchors, the line settles on the bottom while the ship moves on to lay out other runs of baited line. After finishing the final run, the first lines, which may have been out for hours, are finally hauled in. The first deck team is Harold Dub and Asbjorn Dub, father and son. This is the life of the Leicestershire's men, out to sea for two or three weeks at a time, three or four hours of sleep a night, back to Olesen to unload, then home to Dub for a while. For most of the year, they fish in winter waters that are stormy and unpredictable, and in the summer, they are often plagued by fog. This is their life, winter and summer from youth to old age. Without a wasted motion, this operation will go on for hours as one man replaces another. Like some strange relay team in a fisherman's Olympics, they race against time to clear the hooks of valuable cod and worthless skate, to rebate the lines and to rush them over the sides again. The sooner the hold is filled, the sooner they head for home. Through the weeks on a desolate sea, the men regard the gulls as companions, other living creatures who depend upon the fish for life. In the midst of the fishing run, Andreas Dub, the ship's engineer, becomes worried by a persistent knocking in the engine. The speed of the ship is drastically reduced. Oh, 
Captain Arnbeet is told by Andreas, his uncle, that the engine must be checked, a task which cannot be carried out at sea. They decide to run for port in the Faroe Islands. Though it means two days fishing lost, the Leicestershire hoists the Faroe Islands flag and heads for Torshavn Harbor. Unintentionally, these modern Norsemen have retraced one of the earliest voyages of their forefathers. At the turn of the 8th century, Vikings from the coast of Norway first sailed into the Faroe Islands. Here, some settled and founded the civilization which thrives today. Beyond the throbbing seaport, there is a culture and a way of life which retains much of the spirit and the violence of the Vikings. Isolated on a group of islands in the North Atlantic live nearly 40,000 people, descendants of the Vikings who landed here a thousand years ago. There is a time in the pharaohs when a cry re-echoes. Grindabot, the whale alarm. The migrating pilot whales have returned. Small craft of every kind join in the chase to the harbor and the kill. by an armada of small boats. The whales are driven to shallow water where escape is difficult. crucial. If the wounded animal veers sideways in a frantic, unnatural motion, it may stampede the herd through the ring of boats and out to sea. Now even the whales that could escape are drawn back by an overpowering herd instinct. Back, as the natives say, to the blood. The Faroese themselves have speculated that the killing of the whales may be an outlet for a certain native savagery when the Viking blood boils. In these wild harbor roundups are many of the crude, cold-blooded methods that the Vikings practiced in their day. In an hour and a half, perhaps 150 of these great animals will be taken. Most of their lives, they are a gentle, peaceful people. But when the whales come, they revert to another age. Once the harsh reality of their existence drove them to hunt the whale for food. Now, though whale meat is still a favored part of the diet, Grindabot has become a national sport. miles from Scandinavian shores, these rugged islands were settled by Vikings from the coast of Norway. 
now nominally a part of Denmark, the men of the pharaohs have their own language, flag, and currency, and their own traditions, culture, and individual lifestyle. In the ninth century, when Vikings first landed on these Atlantic islands, they found Irish hermits tending sheep. They drove out the hermits, but kept the sheep. Today, the islands are called the Pharaohs, the Sheep Islands. And there are more than 70,000 of these animals, almost twice the human population. These animals are vital to the islanders. Their wool clothes them. Their meat, fresh, salted or dried, feeds them. In the summer, sheep are rounded up to be wormed, treated for sickness, and sheared. For the young, it has always been a special time. <laughs> now, after a thousand years, some of the young are no longer content to be sheep herders. Many are leaving the herds, the land, and the past to the old. In a strange way, tradition remains a part of the pharaoh's economy. In the mid-19th century, these looms provided yarn for nearly 100,000 hand-knit sweaters treasured in the fashionable shops of Europe. Now, these people whom time has forgotten are masters of a vanishing craft. Responding to challenges centuries old, young Faroese still thrill to ancient Viking sports. As they skim across Torshavn Harbor, their traditional high-proud racing boats are symbols of how little life has changed here. But in the days ahead, some will make one final trip across Torshavn Harbor and leave the Faroe Islands forever. To other generations, the sea is not a means of escape, but a source of life. With a decoy, they hunt the guillemots, the diving waterfowl which flourishes in the northern seas. When the birds try to land on the pitching, well-trapped board, their feet are caught in wire snares. To these older islanders, it has never occurred that there is anywhere else to live. Here, you can always live off the sea and the land off the fish and the birds. The puffin, the island's unwitting clown, is easily deceived by man, and by a few pretty decoys set up on sticks. The puffin's oldest natural enemies are predatory birds. For protection, it has learned to nest beneath the ground. But against man, the puffin has no natural defense. The Faroese, since the time they first came to these islands, have hunted the puffin for food. Still, the birds thrive. For among the hunters, there is a code. Those that are nesting or feeding their young are allowed to live. The island's endless volcanic cliffs, pockmarked with crevices and lined with ledges, form a monumental nesting ground. A breeding place for species from north and south these islands comprise one of the greatest bird concentrations in the world. Over 200 species, millions of wild birds. 
Each year, a unique variety of hunter invades Eclipse. The vertical cliffs rise up nearly 2,000 feet from the pounding surf. In their traditional mountaineering apparel, the egg snatchers clamber over these treacherous cliffs for nine days, a time limit set to allow the birds to lay other eggs and survive. In June, the ledges are filled with millions of freshly laid eggs from the guillemots and razorbills, gannets, shearwaters, stormy petrels, and countless others. Each group of birds finds its own niche in the cliff walls. Men still lose their lives pursuing this age-old tradition and sport. The eggs they hunt are a delicacy, a food supplement for winter when the diet is meager and unvarying. Isolated for centuries, the rugged men of the pharaohs are the direct descendants of history's legendary seafarers. Through their veins still courses the blood of the Vikings. They are a dramatic reminder that these towering isles of rock have created a uniquely independent breed of men. Untouched by the outside world, a way of life has survived beyond its time. These rugged northern islands are a last remaining outpost of the Viking spirit. The sea has shaped Scandinavia's character and history. A Norwegian once said, what would we be without the sea? A handful of people on a pile of rock. It is the sea that unites us. Even today, the young people of Scandinavia are never far from the smell of the sea or from its memories. These Norwegian children read the great sagas of the Norsemen. They know of Viking conquests of explorers and navigators and fishermen. Many of their parents and grandparents still live off the sea. And 80% of Norway's people are clustered in towns and villages along a 2,000 mile coastline. Yet for the young, the future holds other promises in a world that has already changed. As long as there are ships in the harbors and oceans of the world, Scandinavians will be manning them, for the destiny of many will always lie with the sea. The flags of the modern Norsemen proclaim a continuing mastery of the oceans and symbolize a way of life that has lasted for over a thousand years. Now the Norsemen no longer come as conquerors. The warlike Vikings have passed into history. But to their descendants, they bequeathed the legacy that time cannot seem to change, a love for the seas. 